we want to look at about four keys of that will help us to understand what being baptized in the spirit is. I think the first key is that Jesus is the only administrator. I know that I introduced that in the earlier lesson, but I think it's important for us to bear down and to understand that that's the case. John chapter one, Matthew chapter three, I indeed baptize you in water. He shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit. He that's doing the baptizing is not the Holy Spirit that's being baptized in. Those are two separate individuals, not the same individual. Furthermore, since the apostles administered the baptism uh, of the Great Commission, it is not the baptism in the Spirit. Matthew 28, you may remember that Jesus said, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore, make disciples of all the nations, and you, I'm emphasizing that, the word you is not uh, written in the American uh, version of that text, but you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The apostles are not the administrator of the baptism in the Spirit, only Jesus Christ. Furthermore, baptism in the Spirit is not promised unto all the nations. Did you notice that? Baptism in the Spirit in, is not in this verse because it's the apostles doing the baptizing. Therefore, you know it's not the baptism in the Holy Spirit. We notice furthermore in Acts chapter 8, baptism of the Spirit could not be bestowed by the laying on of hands except the apostles. The bestowing of the Spirit was only by the laying on of the hands, but the, the laying on of hands and receiving the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands was not the baptism in the Spirit. Because if the laying on of hands results in being baptized in the spirit that makes the apostles the administrators again remember the apostles were the administrator of baptism in water the great commission they were the ones who would lay hands upon christians and they would receive the gift of the holy spirit but that's not the baptism of the spirit because that would be by the wrong administrators Key number two. On Pentecost, only the apostles received the baptism in spirit. I don't want you to notice with me in Acts chapter 1, verse 26. And they gave lots for them, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and Matthias was numbered with the eleven apostles. Now note with me, keep that in mind, the next verse. And when the day of Pentecost was now come, they were all together in one place. What is the pronoun? What is the antecedent of the pronoun they? Acts 1.26. The eleven apostles and they were all together in one place. And that's the they that was baptized in the Spirit. Because suddenly... The Spirit would come upon them, and they, Acts one twenty six, the apostles would receive the Holy Spirit. Notice furthermore in Acts two seven that only that the uh, on Pentecost only the apostles received the baptism in the Spirit. Verse seven of Acts two, they were all amazed and marvelled, saying, "Behold, are not all of these that speak Galileans?" So the apostles are the Galileans. Acts 1, 9. And when he had said this, Jesus, as they, the apostles, were looking, he, Jesus, was taken up in a cloud, received out of their sight. While they were looking steadfastly into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by in white apparel, who also said, Ye men of Galilee. So the Spirit would come upon the Galileans because that's what the, those on Pentecost saw. These that are speaking, are they not Galileans? And in Acts 1, verse 9 through 11, 
he defined who the Galileans were, the apostles. So the Spirit came only upon the apostles on the day of Pentecost. We're in Acts 2, 13. As you look at the King James in Acts 2, verse uh, 13, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. The King James use of the masculine gender, men, is valid, is good Greek, is good English. These men, Therefore, you know that the Spirit did not come upon the 120. It came upon the men who were Galileans. Notice in verse 14. But Peter standing up with the 11 men. I added the word men. Lifted up his voice and said. So here you have the text being extremely clear that the Spirit came upon the men, the Galileans, they're the ones, the apostles that receive the Holy Spirit. And we know from other verses that that is the baptism in the Spirit, because that's what Jesus promised. A third key. Baptism in the Spirit occurred on Pentecost. Acts 1 verse 5. Not many days hence. In Jerusalem, you should be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, examples of the baptism of the Spirit must be in accord with the one known example. You got a couple of guys arguing about who's baptized in the Spirit. Which one is on safe ground, to put it mildly? The fellow who says, well, in order to determine what baptism is spirit, let's look at uh, what happened on Pentecost. Let's look at what was promised on Pentecost. Let's look at the context and the far out context of what occurred on Pentecost and all the verses that affect Pentecost so that we can determine what baptism of the spirit is. And then you have a guy on the other side who says, I don't think that's necessary. I don't think it has to be in accord with what happened with the one example. If a proposed event contains more than that promised and given on Pentecost, it cannot be the baptism of the Spirit. If a proposed event contains less than that promised given on, on Pentecost, it cannot be the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul said, Remember, truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you by signs, wonders, and mighty powers. Therefore, he was behind in no mighty work. If you are behind any mighty work, such as that which was on Pentecost, you have not been baptized in the Spirit. The one certain sign of being an apostle, the one absolute sign that only the apostles had was the ability to give miraculous gifts unto others, to lay hands upon them, Acts 8. If you cannot lay hands on someone and they receive the miraculous abilities, you have not been baptized in the Spirit. You did not receive what they received on Pentecost. You received less than what they received on Pentecost. What one sign is there of being baptized in the Spirit? The ability to have all the powers. Some, however, would say, the conclusion we came to was that there is no one sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's his language. He further said, there are many different signs of the outpouring of the Spirit in the book of Acts. There is no one sign, he continued, of receiving the Spirit. Sometimes, sometimes tongues appear as a sign. Other times they were bold. Other times they would prophesy. 
or other times when they received the spirit, they were full of joy and thanksgiving and they were submissive. They were musical in their praise. Why do we need to make choice of just one? Because the sign of an apostle is the ability to perform all the miracles included in that would be the laying on of hands. And what this writer has done, he has minimized the miraculous because it can just be full of joy. It can just be full of uh, thankfulness. And you've been baptized in spirit. No, 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 no. If one's claim for being baptized in the spirit is less than what occurred on Pentecost and the promises of what occurred on Pentecost, you were not baptized in the spirit. Any phenomenon, any event found before Pentecost cannot be the baptism of the spirit. Any phenomenon after Pentecost, identical to an event found before Pentecost cannot be the baptism of the Spirit. I'm going to say that again. Any event found before Pentecost cannot be the baptism of the Spirit. Any event after Pentecost that's identical to an event before Pentecost cannot be the baptism of the Spirit. The reason I say that is because the Old Testament says that the Holy Spirit would fall upon, come upon, and rest. It would fill, it would be in, it would be poured out uh, upon various people in the Old Testament. But none of them would receive the overwhelming immersion in the Spirit. Not one of them. Because they would receive a gift, because the language would maybe uh, synonymous with some of the language that's connected with being baptized in the Spirit, that doesn't make it baptism in the Spirit, especially since it's less than what occurred on Pentecost. Key number four. After 64 AD, the scriptures teach only one baptism continued to be preached among Christians. I'm reading from Ephesians 4, beginning in verse 4. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. There is one body, one spirit, even as also you're called, and one hope of your calling. Now let me ask you, one body, one spirit, one calling? Verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism one God, verse 6, and Father of all. If you have more than one baptism after 64 AD, you have too many baptisms. You cannot have more than one Lord. You cannot have more than one God. You cannot have more than one baptism. The one baptism of 64 AD is the one in which the apostles were going to, to go into all the world and to baptize every creature. I'm reading from Matthew 28, verse 18 and following. Jesus said, all authority or all power hath been given unto me in heaven or earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You baptize all nations in the name of the Father. When you read Mark, it says, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. In 64 AD, they were still preaching that great commission baptism. But that was the only baptism. There was none other. There was one baptism. We note again in Matthew 28 and in Mark 16, that baptism of the Great Commission being baptized 
in water by the apostles was by the apostles. Therefore, they, the apostles, men, human beings, were the administrator of water baptism, the Great Commission baptism. But we've already found out that we are baptized in the Holy Spirit by only one administrator, and that's Jesus Christ. Some say that the Samaritans received forgiveness of sins before they received the baptism of the Spirit with its accompanying regeneration. But that cannot be. One of our brilliant young men, who's now old like me, he teaches that the Samaritans were baptized in the Spirit when the apostles laid hands upon them. But they also teach that you cannot have, he also teaches, you cannot have remission of sins until you've been baptized in the Spirit. So he has Christians at Samaria who have been believers, been baptized in water, but they haven't been baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. A serious, serious problem. So here are the four keys that are good to know and a good heaven to have in mind whenever you are thinking about being baptized, whenever uh, you are thinking about the subject of baptism in the Holy Spirit. When studying the baptism in the Holy Spirit, there is a little bit of help in understanding what it is by understanding that baptism, baptism in the Spirit, what it was not to accomplish. When we understand what it was not to accomplish, that's a benefit, that's an aid, that's a help for our being able to eliminate some things that are stated to be the baptism of the Spirit. We've looked at Acts 1, verse 4 and 5, and we saw that Jesus said that the apostles were to stay in Jerusalem, tarry there until they be clothed upon, that they be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And that, that was not going to be many days hence. In verse 8 of Acts 1, he said they would receive power when the Holy Spirit would come upon them. I would encourage you to study our first lesson on the baptism of the Holy Spirit in order to see further what we're talking about there. Now, we turn our attention to what baptism of the Spirit was not to accomplish. That will help us to see what Jesus meant. First, Baptism in the Spirit was not to make them believers. The apostles were already believers before they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 16, 16 through 18, you may remember that they, the apostles, on the day that Christ was raised from the dead, that he would point out to them that they had to believe that he was the Christ. But in Matthew 16, 16 through 18, Simon answered and said, upon Jesus asking the question, who, th who do you think I am? Simon said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living uh, God. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, he said, flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my father who is in heaven. So they were already believers in Jesus Christ before they were baptized in the Spirit. We saw in Acts 1, 4, and 5 that they were baptized in the Spirit six months after they were believers, according to the declaration of Jesus Christ in Matthew 16, 16. Number two, baptism in the Spirit was not to fit them for water baptism. They, the apostles, had already been baptized in water. In Matthew 3, Jesus said, I baptize you in water. He shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1, 20, that was, uh, the disciples were with John when that occurred. In John, in Acts 1, 20, after Christ was resurrected, the disciples were gathered together and they point out that the scriptures would teach that another must take the bishopry of 
of uh, Judas. And so they would choose men from among them, watch this, that had accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John. That means that the apostles were already baptized in the Holy Spirit. After all, in uh, Luke 7, they would not be classified with the Pharisees and the, Sa the Pharisees and the Sadducees who had rejected the counsel against of God against themselves, being not baptized of John. They had been baptized and they were baptizing two and three years, three years before they were baptized in the spirit. So baptism of spirit was not to fit them for water baptism. Baptism in the spirit was not to make them repent. I'm turning again to Mark 1, 4. We've already noted that the apostles were baptized in John's baptism. John came, Mark 1, 4, who baptized in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance under remission of sins. He preached a particular type of baptism, and it was a baptism unto repentance. You had to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. You had to repent before you were baptized. So the apostles who were baptized according to John's baptism had already repented. Baptism in the Spirit was not to make them penitent. Fourth, baptism of the Spirit was not to save them. They were saved and out preaching salvation to the Jews three, three and a half years before Pentecost. Fifth, baptism of the Spirit was not to cleanse them. They were already clean. Turn with me to John 15, 3. John 15, 3. Jesus said unto these apostles, already you're clean because of the word which I've spoken unto you. You're already clean. This was before Christ baptized them in the Holy Spirit. Sixth, baptism in the Spirit was not to put them into Christ. In John 15, 4 through 6, abide in me, he said to them. So they were already a part of the vine before they'd been baptized in the Spirit. Seven. Baptism in the Spirit was not to bring them out of the world. They were already, John 17, 16, not of the world. In John 17, 16, this, the words that they were not of the world, were stated two months before they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Two months before Pentecost. Round number two months. The point is before Pentecost, before being baptized in the Spirit. Number eight. Baptism of the Spirit was not to sanctify them. They were to be sanctified by the truth revealed by the Holy Spirit. John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them in thy truth, thy word is truth. Verse 19, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. In 1 Peter 1, 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the elect who are of the dispersion according to the knowledge of God, the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit. So they were sanctified in the truth given by the Spirit, and the Spirit had sanctified them before they were baptized in the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Number nine. Baptism in the Spirit was not to make them sinlessly perfect. 1 John 1, 8. 
1 John 1, 8. The Apostle John says, if we, and he just included himself, and if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess, if we, John includes himself, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no, not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So baptism of the Spirit did not accomplish absolute perfection of morality, spirituality within the apostles because they could still sin. It didn't keep them from sinning. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak from the standpoint of the United Pentecostal Church. They believe that the baptism in the Spirit is synonymous with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism of the Spirit could not be unto remission of sins, for the gift of the Spirit was to be received after receiving remission of sins in water baptism. Peter said, Acts 2.38, Repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, unto the remission of your sins. Be immersed unto the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So being immersed in water and the remission of sins and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit are not the same thing. That's not the United Pentecostal Church viewpoint. To them, the gift of the Holy Spirit is the baptism of the Spirit. But the apostles had already been baptized in the Spirit and had already been baptized in water unto remission of sins. In Acts 8, verse 12, and when they believed, the Samaritans, believed Philip preaching good tidings concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. So here you have those who were baptized unto the remission of sins. And you'll notice that they received the gift of the Holy Spirit by the laying on of the apostles' hands. That's how Christians in the first century received the gift of the Holy Spirit, which was not the baptism of the Spirit. So these are just some things that the baptism of the Spirit does not accomplish.